This might sound kind of slightly off topic, but if you're applying for a job, let me give you a tip as to how to actually write a cover letter. So again, if you're applying for a job and you're writing a cover letter, it does you no good to simply say that you have a particular set of skills. What you're supposed to do is describe your experience in such a way to suggest that you actually have those skills. So for example, instead of saying simply that you're organized and you have a keen attention to detail, perhaps you might say that I have developed a keen sense of organization and attention to detail after my years of working in database administration. To use another example, instead of saying simply that you have people skills, perhaps you might say you've developed a whole range of interpersonal skills as a result of, for example, working as a barista at Starbucks. And again, the whole idea is that it doesn't really matter what you say about yourself. What matters is what you do. What matters is what you've done. Because what you've done demonstrates whether or not what you say about yourself is actually true. And perhaps one suggests that the same principle actually applies when it comes to the gospel. So think, for example, of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, this really iconic exchange between the Lord and St. Peter at Caesarea Philippi. So you probably remember how this goes. So the Lord is talking to his disciples, and what he says to them is, who do people say that I am? And basically the response is, some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist, others say Moses or one of the prophets. But then, of course, the Lord says, who do you say that I am? And Peter, on behalf of all the disciples, says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, which, of course, is the right answer. And the Lord basically affirms his answer as such. So basically what he says to Peter is, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And so again, he kind of affirms that Peter has given the right answer. But then, of course, you recall what the Lord says after that. So he basically says that the Messiah will suffer and die at the hands of his enemies before being raised from the dead three days later. In response to which, Peter takes the Lord aside and rebukes him. Lord, this must never happen to you. In response to which the Lord basically rebukes him, get behind me Satan, you become a stumbling block to me. Right? And you see what's being revealed here is a certain disconnect between what St. Peter says and what he actually believes. So again, what he says is, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Thereby suggesting that he believes in the person of Christ and everything that he stands for. On the other hand, he denies the reality of the suffering Messiah. Thereby denying the nature and purpose of the mission. The Messiah must never suffer and die for the salvation of the world. Right? And the whole idea here is that when Christ poses to us the question, who do you say that I am? The response isn't really, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, because in a certain sense, words are cheap. The response that you're supposed to give to him is how you live your life. And so, for example, do you spend time with Christ? Do you pray? Do you go to Mass? Do you lean on Christ in times of trouble? Or, in fact, do you lean on yourself? And does your life demonstrate a certain quiet humility, which in turn demonstrates a deep trust in Christ and a deep conviction that all things work together for the good for those who love the Lord? Or, in contrast, do you complain all the time? Are you harsh towards your neighbor? And on top of that, are you mean and bitter and cruel? Mindful, again, that your response to the Lord's question, who do you say that I am, is revealed by how you live your life, for better or for worse. But we can even take the thing one step further, right? So think, for example, of the Gospel of John, chapter 6. Not so much the multiplication of the loaves and the fish, but what transpires immediately after that miracle. So basically, in the aftermath of that great miracle, the people, again, are wrestling with this key idea of who Jesus Christ actually is. And so just to kind of think it through, the multiplication of the loaves and the fish ultimately reminds the people of God of an earlier miracle in the context of the Old Testament. Specifically in the book of Exodus chapter 16, where God rains down upon the Israelite people in the desert manna from heaven through the intercession of the prophet Moses. And so given all that, what they're basically thinking to themselves is perhaps Jesus is the new Moses, the one who is meant to provide for all their material needs, the one who is meant to give them enough bread basically to fill their bellies. Now, before we dismiss this kind of early preliminary theory, we got to appreciate how much this particular notion of Christ resonates with the modern notion of who Christ actually is, right? Because how often, in terms of the modern mindset, do we think of Jesus Christ simply as a genie in the bottle, the one who exists solely to provide for our material needs whenever we want in the very manner in which we seek it? Whereas in contrast, what does Christ say? It's kind of interesting. He doesn't deny that he's meant to supply them bread. What he clarifies is the nature of that bread. So what he says is, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will not hunger, and whoever believes in me will not thirst. And you see, what's being conveyed here is essentially two points. The first point is kind of obvious. The second point, not so much. So the first point is basically the reality of the Holy Eucharist, right? The source and son of our faith, where Christ is truly and sacramentally present to us in the Eucharistic species. So hopefully that goes without saying. Again, the second point, though, is a little more subtle, right? So the idea here is this. 
the peace and the rest and the joy that you're ultimately searching for. These things are not ultimately meant to be found in a perfect set of material circumstances, like the perfect house, or the perfect job, or the perfect boyfriend or girlfriend. But instead, you're meant to only find these things in a stance of being in right relationship with God and being in right relationship with God who is fully present to you through the incarnation of His only begotten Son. Now, I realize that might sound kind of vague and abstract, so let me give you kind of a concrete example from my own life. And this involves a trip to the dentist. So obviously I've been to the dentist a whole bunch of times, but this involves a trip to the dentist that I took when I was in the seminary. So obviously I studied at St. Augustine Seminary in Scarborough, Ontario, uh, studying to be a priest. And so this was a time, again, when I was in the seminary, getting my teeth cleaned. And um, so as you know, when you go to the dentist, the dentist is basically the closer, right? So he finishes things off, he consults with you a little bit, but the vast majority of the session is with the dental hygienist. So that was the case with me, right? So I was getting my teeth cleaned by the dental hygienist, and she found out pretty early on that I was a, a Catholic seminarian. She was Catholic herself, and so she used the opportunity to kind of talk about her life, her faith journey, her, her fears, her struggles, um, things she was wrestling with in terms of uh, her relationship with the church and God and, and you know, the whole nine yards. In response to which, in the moment, I basically said nothing because I had stuff in my mouth. Like, what are you going to say, <laughs> right? So what I said to her was like, look, um, you want to grab a coffee afterwards and we can talk at length about this stuff when there's, all, there's not all this junk in my mouth. So she agreed and we went. And during that um, little coffee session, the thing I was kind of noticing the most, uh, quite apart from what she was saying, although I was certainly paying attention to what she was saying, uh, the, thing I, the thing I noticed the most was that she seemed to be all over the place. So again, quite apart from what she was actually saying, in terms of her, her delivery, the way she was conveying the narrative, she was completely all over the place. And so what I suggested to her was the idea of going to the sacrament confession. I think I asked her, like, when's the last time you made a confession? Um, in response to which, she seemed kind of offended. So uh, she said to me basically, like, why? Like, do you think I'm a big sinner? In response to which I said to her, I think, um, I don't know, like, maybe. But um, the reason I bring this up is because of a story that involves Cardinal Thomas Collins. So basically, as you know, uh, Cardinal Thomas Collins is currently serving as the Archbishop of Toronto. And I remember a time when he came to visit us in the seminary, uh, again, when we were signing to be future priests, right? And so basically the gist of it was this. What he said was like, look, guys, if ever you're feeling empty, sad, lost, or confused, don't think that you're experiencing these things because of your circumstances. Maybe that's the case, but in the vast majority of cases, it's actually not the case. What you want to do is realize that a lot of times sin sort of accumulates on the heart. So again, whenever you're experiencing these symptoms of feeling sad, empty, lost, or confused, wherever the case may be, what you want to do is make a beeline to the confessional and give a sincere, honest, forthright confession. And what you'll realize in the vast majority of cases is that those symptoms just kind of disappear by the power of the sacraments. At which point you realize in retrospect that the reason why I was experiencing these things was not because my material circumstances were imperfect. You were experiencing these things because somehow over the course of your journey, you had fallen out of a stance of right relationship with God. Now, when I said this thing to this girl, um, I wasn't sure really how she received it. So we kind of, you know, ended our session and we went our separate ways. But then weeks later, she wrote me this nice little card. She figured out where I lived and she wrote me this nice little thank you card saying that she actually took a chance and decided, you know, why not? Like, why not just go to the sacrament confession? And so she went, and in the aftermath of that sacrament, of that experience, um, she experienced this, this peace and this joy and this rest that she hadn't experienced in a really long time. And again, for that, she just wanted to convey her, her thanks and her gratitude. Now, obviously, the reason I bring this up is to extol the sacrament confession to extol the beauty and the grace and the majesty of the sacrament confession. And maybe for yourself, if you're, if you're listening to this, maybe you haven't been for a long time, for whatever reason, right? Maybe it's because of personal circumstances, maybe it's because of the current pandemic. Um, in response to which, I, I encourage you to, to go. Just go, take a chance and go. And come to realize, perhaps in retrospect, what Christ actually means when he says to us, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will not hunger, and whoever believes in me will not thirst. And may God bless you all.